Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, thumma ma ba'd. I uh, didn't share a title because this was not going to be a lecture, it was going to be a rant. Inshallah. Um, and it was going to be a rant about a frustration I've been feeling for a long time that I want to share with you and hopefully I want you to feel it, feel it with me if you don't already. Okay? Um, alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah. I've gotten a chance to get intimately close to a good number of communities all over the country. And I've noticed a serious contradiction. You have a town like Houston, and you have Muslims spending up, you know, more than almost three weeks studying Islam day and night in one part of it. And not too far from here, maybe within a one mile radius, you have Muslims doing things I can't say here. And it's the majority. You have masajid where people are coming from for Jummah prayer. And they have some serious, serious problems. Like when I say serious problems, I'm not just talking about theological issues, which are serious. I'm not just talking about issues of ignorance in terms of knowledge. That's serious too. I'm talking about serious psychological problems, serious family problems, drug alcohol, you name it. They're coming to Friday prayer. And the one place that's supposed to give them their solutions, guess what? It's not. We're going across the country and subhanAllah, it's a gift of Allah that we, masajid, have now become a part of the American landscape. Masajid are incredibly, we've got large multi-million dollar properties. I mean, we're huge. We're huge. And subhanAllah, how we've been able to raise those funds. Because usually, the masjids in the world landscape, they are government funded projects or they're public projects. These are privately funded institutions that are being built all over this country. And yet, these same masjids are not equipped, not nearly equipped for the most part to deal with some of the most basic problems of the Muslim community. I'm going to share this problem with you at three levels. First, I'll just talk about the youth, just the youth. I would argue theoretically that there are three kinds of youth, Muslim youth. There are three kinds of Muslim youth. There's the you kind of youth. You know what that means? They're somehow identified as religious. They're attending religious programs and they're learning it's in whatever capacity. They're attending some sort of a halaqa. They have some sort of a relationship with an imam or two. Right? They're watching videos on YouTube, downloading MP3s off the internet, reading articles, books, this and that. Attend, you know, uh, blogging on like you know religious websites, asking fatwa questions, that sort of thing. Religious youth. On the other end of the spectrum, you have the messed up youth. Who are these guys? These guys are Muslim too, but you wouldn't know. You would not know. And the things that you say astaghfirullah to, the things that you pass by, and you say la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, that's nothing for them. That's just the beginning. They are up to some really bad stuff. Really bad. And it's so bad that if I sit, and we've actually done this in Virginia when I was there, you sit down with a couple of imams and you explain to them what the youth are doing. You take a couple of messed up youth that you can talk to, you bring them over and you say, why don't you, Mr. Messed Up Youth, tell Mr. Imam here what you guys are up to. And the imam refuses to believe it. No, come on. That's, no, that's impossible. Does that even exist? Yep, that exists. It's a scary reality. That is the messed up youth. And then there's the middle youth. You know who they are? They used to be party animals. Then they somehow accidentally stumbled upon an MSA. Or accidentally clicked on a YouTube video. Or they, one of their friends became religious or something. And so they're kind of, sort of inclined. Maybe they'll put a hijab on sometimes. Maybe they'll let it grow for a couple of days. Right? But then they sometimes drift back, then they get pulled here, then they, they're sort of in the middle. They're, sort of, they're good kids. They're good kids. They're not as bad as the messed up youth, but they're in the middle. So you got three kinds of youth. You know what my theory is? My theory is most of us were messed up. Illa mashallah. Most of us were messed up. And then slowly we started transitioning. And eventually we became what you could call religious youth. A lot of us. Okay? We became what you, I'm not saying you're good people. I'm just giving a social term. Okay? I don't know the state of your iman and you don't know the state of mine. But we became religious. And when youth become religious, you know what happens? 
The way they speak changes. The things they like and they dislike changes. The, the friends they keep company with naturally changes. Because how do you make friends? You make friends based on common social activities, right? So you obviously you're not hitting up the movie theater, you're not going to the club anymore. You're not hanging out with your non-Muslim friends who curse and, you know, all the time. So obviously you found new friends at the masjid. You found friends among students of knowledge, etc. Et so your culture changed. Your culture went through a paradigm shift. And this change, you know who started noticing this change in you? Your family. We'll talk about that a little later. When, you, when a lot of you went through this change, your family started noticing that you're going through a change. For a lot of you, this is a reality. But then for others, you got cut off from your friends. You started, slowly got drifted away completely from your friends. Now tell me, if I was to put percentages on this, what percent of the youth do you think are religious? Just throw a number out there. You're very generous. I'd give a fraction of a percent. I'd give a fraction of a percent to religious youth. I'd say about 10, 20 percent at the most would be the kind of, sort of, convention youth. Right, those youth. And then I would say probably the vast majority of Muslim kids, Muslim youth, are messed up. They're entirely messed up. And they have little to no exposure to Islam. But you know the gift of Allah to us? The gift of, of Allah to us is even the messed up youth, a good number of them, show up to Juma prayer. Even they show up to Juma prayer. Now, you know this, this event has a tuition. You have to make a sacrifice to come here. You have to take a flight. You have to book a hotel. You have to make arrangements to be here. If there's a program at the masjid, flyers have to be passed out, Facebook events have to be made, emails have to be sent out, people have to make phone calls, encourage each other to show up. How many flyers are sent out for Jummah prayer? Any Facebook event for Jummah prayer? Coming this Friday. No, nothing. You nobody else? Who's the khatib? I don't know if I'm coming this week. I don't know. I don't know who the khatib is. The khatib could be the, the, like the, the kind of khatib that makes you want to like bang your head on a wall. You'll still go. Allah created this institution for which it's a national convention of the Muslims every week. Allah designed it. So that Muslims can stay in touch with their religion, no matter how messed up they get. There's still something there. So now, I want you to appreciate what a strategic role, what a critical role the khutbah plays in the life of a community. I'm giving you a series, I'm reality, I'm giving you just realistic Personal experience stories. Kid shoots up some drugs in the parking lot of the masjid in his car, sniffs it up, then comes to Jummah prayer. He comes there. And he's listening to a khutbah about some technicalities that were discussed in the 8th century or the 12th century. Or he, he hears names of 18 scholars that this guy, this young guy who's a student of knowledge, he learned all this knowledge, so he's got to regurgitate it somewhere. So guess where he finds the opportunity to regurgitate his knowledge? At the member. He's going to let people know how much he learned. Right? Does anybody in the audience care? Nope. And then you know what else the youth does? The youth brings up, and this, some of you are not going to like what I'm going to say, but I'm going to say it anyway because it hurts my feelings. Only because of that. And I'm seriously concerned. There's a, you know, the religious youth are of different ideologies. The religious youth belong to different ideologies. And because we're youth, and before we were youth, it was this gang versus that gang, gang, Lakers versus Knicks or whatever back in the day, Bulls versus whatever, Spurs. But after Islam, after you became religious, guess what it became? This school versus that school. This theological understanding versus that theological understanding. This many taraweeh versus that many taraweeh. This masjid versus that masjid, this imam versus that imam, etc. This speaker versus that speaker. Don't listen to that guy, he'll send you to hell. Don't listen to that guy, he'll send you to hell. Oh man, did this, you listen to that guy? Oh, you're going to hell too? Okay, then I don't want to talk to you anymore. We created this. Not based on knowledge, most of it. Most of it is based on just immature, immature rhetoric. Immature garbage. So we, and we brought this where? The tragedy is we brought this immature nonsense to the member. We brought it to the member. So, in essence, I mean, I went to business school, so I'm thinking of it from a marketing business point of view, okay? Here we are, a fraction of a percent, debating and fighting each other over territory over how much of the Muslims? That fraction of that one percent, while the rest of them can forget who cares. Who cares about them? I don't even care. We have forgotten that they even exist. Our debates, our blogs, 
our, our discourse is relevant to a small minority. You should be grateful that you're even having that discussion. The vast majority of people are gone. They are out there. I gave, uh, you know, I give the Divine Speech Seminar, and it's open to Muslims and non-Muslims. So a few non-Muslims have attended also. The one I gave in Tampa, Florida, this youth came up to me at the end. And the first night is just the beauty of Surah Al-Fatiha. It's a little bit technical, but most of it is pretty straightforward. He came up to me at the end. He said, I haven't been in the masjid for six months. One of my friends told me to come because there's free fruit, food tonight. He came up to me and told me. And then he pulled me to the side and he told me the kind, he's 17 years old, Muslim kid. He's into martial arts, you know, a, a well-built kind of guy. And he's done things in his life that you wouldn't want to know about. He's already done them. And he said, well, how do I change myself? I'm addicted already. How do I get rid of this stuff? And why is he asking me? I don't live there. I'm just coming to visit. Who should he be asking this question? Who should be there for him? Imam of the masjid. The youth group of the masjid. The knowledgeable kid, the youths. You guys. What's your job? You're the ambassadors of Islam. That's what you are. Now, the warning, the warning label I present to you is, what you learn at an advanced level, like the, even the lecture on Balagha, what you learn at an intermediate advanced level, is not there that you regurgitate it to the masses. That's a mistake. People, the, the reason that pe you can't give that to people, if they were ready for that, they would have been here. They are not ready for that. They need something much more basic. You need to water it down. You need to keep the message simple. You know, we, on the one hand, our religion is so sophisticated. And it's so intellectual. And it's so deep. And you guys appreciate that. You've been studying deen. But on the other hand, if you just start reading Quran, and you read what the messengers say to the people, on another level, isn't it so simple? فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَاطِعُونَ Have taqwa of Allah, follow me. Simple. They're keeping it simple. Fear the fire. Nothing complicated. You can get into a discussion about what are the features of the fire. Right? And you can write a 50 page thesis on the hellfire or the features of paradise. But a farmer doesn't need a thesis. All he needs to hear is, man, I want to go to paradise. I don't want to go to hellfire. You keep it simple too. What have we done? We, we've done this injustice to our own. Number one. We've done this injustice to our own. Now here's a strategic plan of action. Brothers and sisters. Please listen to this carefully, inshallah. And make up your own strategy. This is just some things that are rattling around in my mind. The religious youth, once they become religious, they create a certain kind of language and culture which automatically cuts themselves off from the not-so-religious youth. And especially cuts themselves off from who? What's that third category? The messed up youth. Completely cuts themselves off. Okay? Who's supposed to reach them? On the one hand, we talk about da'wah to Islam. Bringing new Muslims in, which is an obligation. On the other hand, our own are leaving by the floodgates. They're becoming religious by the trickles, and they're leaving by the whole faucet is open. It's gushing out. So you, it's counterproductive to not be concerned with the loss of our own. With the loss of our own. Now, how do we do this? How do we do this? First and foremost, don't expect the people to come to you. You have to go to the people. You have to do that. You have to start thinking like that. And you know where the people are? Let me tell you where the people are. They're not in nice places. They're at the shisha place. They're at the pool place. They're playing at the ballpark where the guys use foul language all the time. Right? They're, they're at those places. I'm not saying you become one of them. But you know what? Those are the members of this ummah. And when they said, La ilaha illallah at any point in their life, they become more beloved to me than what blood makes, the connection that I form with blood. This is thicker than blood. We are concerned about them. We love them for the sake of Allah. We start thinking in terms of Amr bil ma'roof and nahi al munkar. We start bashing and you know, cursing the Muslims who sell alcohol or who own these the haram businesses or that do haram things on the internet, etc., etc. Did anybody stop to think, maybe I should try and save this person? What if this person was your brother? What if this person was your neighbor? What if it was your best friend? You would just hate on them just like that? Right? We don't have love for this ummah. We're too easy, to, too quick to pass judgment on them. We have to, you know, find a way to start pulling them in slowly. Pulling them, and you, ha you can't do that until you treat people like human beings. You can't do that. If you treat them like evildoers, or just, you know, this, this, uh, you know, this labeled fasik, or, you know, deviant, or, 
whatever else. You know, their aqidah is messed up, forget them. No, 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 no. These are the assets of this ummah. Allah gave them the blessing of la ilaha illallah because Allah sees something in them. And Allah gave us the, whatever He gave us, whatever concern He gave us because he, he expects us to do something with it. He expects something out of us. So this is the first thing I want to, at least there should be a discussion in your circles. I can't give you the answers, I can at least give you the problem. In your own circles, there needs to be a discussion. How do we reach out to these youth? How do we work with them? I'll give you a couple of sto- interesting stories. There was a youth group, I won't mention where it was, that you know, had messed up kids too. Because they used to play basketball, and they used to go out and hang out later on, eat at the restaurant, nothing religious for a while. And the guy running the youth group was very religious. And I told them, just run the group, man. Just don't worry about teaching them anything. Just run the, run the thing, right? And the masjid has a ball gym, a basketball gym. So they come in and they play ball. They're playing late at night. They're using filthy language in the masjid gym. If an uncle sees it, especially a desi uncle, what's going to happen? Oh, forget about it. <laughs> yeah, so he's like, get out of here, you know, and don't come back. Hey, what kind of masjid? It's masjid. Right? Now, tell me this. This guy with tattoos all over his body, rings in places you wouldn't want, playing basketball, you curse him out, where's he going to go? What's the next step? If he's not here, he's at the club. He's somewhere else. At least he's here. At least he'll hear the adhan from Maghrib. Maybe he might even join us for salat one day in a few weeks. Maybe. But somebody has to treat this person like what first? A person, a human being. Someone worth, you know, saving. Or at least the, that they should be given the message in a decent fashion. That They deserve that much. Now, give you another example. Just what's going on in the masajid. Ramadan, two years ago. A guy, totally drunk. I mean, this guy is drunk. Muslim guy. Walks into the masjid during taraweeh prayer. Can't even stand straight. Guess what happens next? They kick him out. Dude, he came to the masjid. Does that tell you something? Does that tell you that he's trying to seek help? Does that tell you he's trying to quit? Why would he bring himself in the middle of humiliation? Why would he do that? He needs help. You're, the only help you provide was curse and yell and a'udhu billah and kick him out. This is what we do to Muslims. Imagine what we do to non-Muslims. This is a Muslim. Now I'll give you a non-Muslim story. You may have heard this one on a video somewhere. True story again. So this guy, he's a, he's a Vietnamese guy. He's a Muslim. And his co-worker is an idol worshipper. You know, Vietnamese have a lot of different idol worship sort of religious traditions. And he's one of them. I forget which one specifically. But the co-worker, the, the idolatrous co-worker says to his Muslim co-worker, hey man, I want to come with you to your worship on Friday. So the guy keeps putting him off, no, 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 I don't know, I don't think you're ready. But he keeps insisting, so he takes him to the masjid. So they go to the masjid. And they go to the masjid and he sees, he looks around and everybody's making ruku' and sujood and qiyam, everybody's making so that's before Jumu'ah time. And he says, man, where's the statue? Because everybody's kind of doing this stuff, but I don't see any statue. He says, no, no, we don't have a statue. You can't, you can't you know, uh, put an image to the master of the world. He's beyond images. That would be putting a limit on him. He says, that's amazing. How do you pray to this God? He says, just like these people are praying. So he sees people doing what? Qiyam, ruku, suju. He says, ah, I get it. He went down like that. Guess where he learned that from? From his own religion. Right? So this brother sees this from a distance. His brother sees it from a distance. In the spirit of Amr bin Ma'roof and Nahi Ali al-Munkar, he gets up, he comes over, grabs the guy by the shirt, drags him outside the masjid, throws him out and says, until you learn to make the salah according to the sunnah, don't you come back. Uh, we at the masjid level are not ready to deal with the people that need our help. We're not ready. What if a woman inappropriately dressed walks into the masjid? What's going to happen? What if a guy that's covered in tattoos, like some MMA fighter or something, walks into the, the, the elders in the masjid, oh my God, the jal came so early? You know, <laughs> all hell will break loose. We're not ready to deal with people. What da'wah are we talking about? What are the da'wah centers? You don't need to build a da'wah center. They're already built. What are they? It's the masjid. It's the, and who are the da'is of the masjid? The students of knowledge, the youth. They are the, they are the eyes and the ears of this ummah. They are the faculties of this work. You. 
So you have to understand, number one, the critical role that you're in as far as the work of this ummah is concerned. But I want to bring it closer to home. Remember I said when you turn, turn a religious leaf, who starts noticing you're changing? Your family, let's talk about that a little bit. So your family starts noticing that you're uh, not taking that thing off your head. Your family also starts noticing that it's getting a little fuzzy out here. And your friends have the fuzzy stuff too. Your friends change. You don't hang out with those other boys anymore. So your mom gets a little concerned. She says, I want you to be Muslim, but not Muslim Muslim. This is not why you came to America. Right? They get concerned. They get concerned. She's, the, the mother says to the daughter, the father says to the daughter, who's going to marry you looking like that? We don't do this like that in our family. Why don't you act like the rest of the family? What's the matter? You're embarrassing us. We can't take you to the wedding looking like that. We can't take you here. Do you face this? You know people that face this. In other words, what's happened is the people that are trying to hold on to any strand of the religion have become the outcasts of the ummah in their own homes. They have become the outcasts and you're the weirdos. We're, this is the weirdo convention right here. We are the outcasts of our own families. We are the objects of ridicule. You, get at the, you go to the Eid gathering for most of you. Oh, Maulana is here. Issue me the fatwa, huh? So is this haram too? Is that haram? Remember last year when you used to be partying with us? What happened now? All religious now? Okay. We get it. We understand. You become the object of ridicule. And through you, Islam. And when you hear Islam, Islam being made fun of, or halal and haram being toyed around with at the end of a coffee table, what happens to you, young Muslim? Grrr. And when that happens to you, what do you do? Astaghfirullah, this is a bid'ah, your people, your aqidah is messed up, oh, you're following your culture, not the religion, slam the door, walk out. And then your parents come back to you and say, oh, so this is what the religion teaches you, right? Talk to your parents like that? They got you good. They got you on lock. Understand this. When you become serious about the religion, be mentally prepared. Some of you are blessed with you know, very good families, walhamdulillah, but many of you have this trial. Or you know people who have this trial. You know, one of the worst things in our deen, one of the worst things in our deen, is so much as talking back to our parents. Right? Now know this. Know this as a reality. I see a lot of young faces here, so I say this. Know this. Your father, for the sons here, your father, knows exactly what to say to get under your skin and make it burn. He knows exactly what to say. And he knows that it burns too. And he says it anyway. You know why? Not because he hates you, because he wants to see what you're going to do next. He wants to test your patience. And if you do snap, if you do flip out, he's going to say, aha, this is what the religion teaches you. This is what that imam's been telling you. Uh, this is what that ilm samik. <laughs> That's what's going to happen. You come back. You come back with a B in your math in your calculus class. Guess what's going to be blamed? Your religion. Your religion. You lose your job. Guess what's going to be blamed? Your religion. By who? Not the non-Muslims. Your family. This is because of that face of yours. This is because you're always going to the masjid. That's why they probably fired you. This is why you failed. In other words, all of your successes will be overlooked. And all of your failures will be attributed to psychological war inside your home. It's a psychological battle inside your home. And your, if you want all of the good that you're trying to do, you're trying to, trying to attend classes, go to conferences, sit in the company of shuyukh, listen to hours and hours of lectures, stay away from music, stay away from movies, stay away from bad companies, keep your eyes low. Oh my God, there's so much to do. You want to watch all of that, multiply that by zero, talk back to your parents for a second. And we do. We do. We, we can't take it. It gets under our skin. It boils over. And we say, oh, how dare you? And then we just, that one time you snapped, done. There's a reason that Allah Azza wa Jal puts you know, the, 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 the gratefulness to them at such a high regard. And you know, if your blood boils, if they do something wrong, I would think Ibrahim alayhi salam's blood would boil a lot more because his dad makes idols. Talk about a bad aqidah. Right? He makes them. How does he talk to him? Respect, love. Ya abati, my beloved father. My bo he's kicking him out of the house. He says, I make dua for you. 
I'll ask my master to forgive you. As he's getting kicked out of the house. Not fine. I'm on the sunnah. No. <laughs> it's not the discourse. It's a different discourse. We have to learn. We have to learn to grow a thick skin. I'll tell you a personal story. You'll enjoy this story. My dad experimented with me. And my mom taught me. She, she realized what he's doing. And she said, listen, you need to understand to learn how to play the game. And then I was, I was like, oh, I've been a dummy for so long. I didn't know. You know what my dad did? My dad loves to do this. He comes to me and says, I was listening to the Shia speaker. He's so good. <laughs> and he makes a lot of good points. And he just goes on and on and on talking about the Shia guy and, you know, how they have really good arguments and stuff. And all of a sudden I'm cringing and, like, my face is turning colors. And then my mom told me how to play the game. So the next time he came up to me and said that, I said, yeah, I heard him. He's awesome. I mean, his arguments were unbelievable. My dad says, don't listen to him. <laughs> so <laughs> I ended that conversation right there. <laughs> But the idea is, know that your parents will psychologically test you. you. You think they don't understand, man. They were changing your diapers. They understand you. They know what you're all about. They've sized you up. They have. Don't underestimate them. Don't, oh, they don't get it. They don't understand my concerns about Islam. They do, please. They do. Relax. Learn to first develop the family relations. If you are studying the deen and you're destroying family relations at the same time, your priorities are somewhere they shouldn't be. You need to fix family ties. This is a fundamental of our religion. It's a fundamental premise of our deen. And now let me tell you what, the last thing I want to share with you about my rant, about how there's this dichotomy. You don't have to raise your hands. I'm going to, make, I'm going to stereotype all of you anyway. I've already stereotyped you as the, as the weirdos in your family. Why would Allah put you in that family anyway? Why wouldn't he put you like in Abu Hanifa's family or like, Imam Shafi's lineage, where all your uncles are Hufad of Quran and Muhaddithun. Why do you have a sister that's so nasty? Why do you have a brother that's, oh my God, I don't believe this guy. Why do you have cousins that are just completely on a different planet? If they were not family, you would have never met them. You would never even want to look at them. They're so different from you. And that's, to me, this is my deviant understanding, is exactly the point. Allah Azza wa made us family with people. So we could become Islam, Islam's ambassadors to them because nobody else was going to reach to them. Who was going to reach to them? We were. When, you're giving, when I'm giving a speech to you guys, you're actually here to listen to me. Let me try giving this speech to my cousin. Let me try giving it to my uncle. Let me try giving it to my mother. How's it going to go? Acha boy. That's in Urdu. Or be quiet. Right? Get out of here. It's just you. Sheikh Yasir. His parents came, and I was really honored. He came and he told me that you came to see me. I was like, he didn't come to see you? He goes, it's just me. <laughs> right? Family is family. It's just family. So you will get overlooked. You may have a lot of respect. You're running the halaqa. You're the MSA president. You're the khatib. You're this, you're that. You're the qabila, the emir of the qabila. You're, you know, you're the guy that went to Ilm Summit from the community, but you're nothing in the family. You're nothing. Get used to that. Make da'i as a nothing. Make, da make da'wah as a nothing, rather. Learn, learn to take the hits. Learn to take the insults and live with them. Pull people out slowly. Change their behavior towards you. Be the best to your family, and that is the da'wah of Islam. They don't need your speech. They don't need the notes from this class. They don't need the notes from, this, from, from the entire summit. They don't, they don't, your family doesn't care for them. They don't. You know what they need? They need you to go home. Without asking, you vacuum the house for your parents. You do the groceries. You buy your arms and flowers. You do stuff without even asking. Your dad always wants you to get better grades. You focus on that one class to show your daddy you got those better grades. Not for the grades, but for your father, because making your father happy will serve your dean in the end. Think long term. Think long term. Start thinking about the, the relationship with your family. I've noticed too often, too often, too often, young Muslims that are serious about religious learning are overlooking family obligations. They're overlooking family obligations. And the this, this is the bigger problem. And the second tier problem is that they're becoming self-righteous without realizing it. What does that mean? They see other Muslims that are in the rut. They see other Muslims that are in the haram. And they assume somehow that they are what? 
they're better or at least they're not doing that. Astaghfirullah, I wouldn't associate with those people. Where were you two years ago? Were you not there? Who, to, who pulled you out, right? Who pulled you out? Allah Azza wa Jal mentions this in the Quran. The ayat of the journey of this ummah. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu attaqullah haqqa tuqatih wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. Taqwa was the first thing. You develop taqwa inside you that brought you to this concern about not dying unless you are what? Unless you're a Muslim. And then what held you on to this taqwa was the next step. وَاعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا But then when you hold on to this rope, which is the book of Allah, what is the next instruction? وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا Don't divide among yourself. What did we make as an easy observation about religious youth? What happens when they get religious immediately? Division is the first thing that's associated with them. لَا تَفَرَّقُوا وَذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ You know what should be the public discourse? Here's the ayah. Make mention of the favor of Allah upon you. Mention the, be positive. Make, the, make mention of the favor of Allah upon you. إِذْ كُنْتُمْ أَعْدَاءً فَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِكُمْ فَأَصْبَحْتُمْ بِنِعْمَتِهِ إِخْوَانًا وَكُنْتُمْ وَكُنْتُمْ عَلَى شَفَى حُفْرَةٍ مِنَ النَّارِ You all were at the very edge of hell. That's where you were. فَأَنْقَذَكُمْ مِنْهَا Then he rescued you from, uh, you from it. He re- Allah rescued you. So Allah is the one who rescued you. So instead of looking down upon the next, find a way to rescue them. You know, last story I'll give you and I'm done inshallah ta'ala. One of my heroes uh, uh, in, in the country as far as da'wah is concerned and real genuine concern, we should learn something from this brother, is brother Eddie from the Dean, so, dean Show. He says corny things sometimes. And that's part of his th- deal, you know. It's all good though. But if you, because if you hang out with this guy, he is a da'wah machine. This guy is incredible. He is absolutely incredible. He doesn't see, oh man, what's this guy going to think? What's that guy going to think? I'm going to talk to him about Islam. He will talk to everyone. I mean, we were at, I was walking around, just walking down the street with him, and there's this guy in a wheelchair, and we're just waiting, just standing there waiting to cross the street. He turns over, man, don't you think we should just worship one God? And the guy's like, yeah, of course. And he goes, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm so, people just worry about themselves. They don't worry about the one who created them. Don't you think so? He goes, yeah, I do. I just have a five-minute conversation. And he says, here's my number. I want you to come over. And by the way, this is Islam. This is when you really worship one God. Well, who of us would have the courage to just start a conversation? Like, Man, this guy's going to curse me out. He's going to stab me. What's, you know, if you're in New York, then, right? What else might happen? But subhanAllah, he doesn't see you know, what might happen. He sees that he has a message to deliver. Genuine concern. Genuinely concern. His, his tenant, he's, he's in a building and his tenants are some of these guys that are like, uh, like you know, they, they, they work out and stuff and they're, they do that jujitsu stuff. Right? That, that uh, Brazilian, yeah, jiu-jitsu, Brazilian jujitsu, right. So there's non-Muslim guys, a lot of non-Muslim guys. A lot of them have become Muslim too. So this one guy, he, I was staying with him at the apartment. And this one guy, one of his tenants, he was about to go into his apartment, but his key got stuck. For a, you know how sometimes your key gets stuck? Look, split second. He says, he goes, hey, uh, Mike, come here. I want to talk to you. Come inside. I, want, I got something for you. And he pulls him into the apartment where I'm saying, he says, you know you asked me, I, I told you about Islam that other day? He goes, yeah. Well, here's a guy you can ask everything you want. He put me on the spot. <laughs> And, you know, this guy, the, the guy I was talking to, apparently, he wanted to be an MMA fighter. Chucked up like this. Literally tattoos everywhere. And he wants to know about Islam. Before passing judgment on who he is, just deliver the message. I know brothers that were skinheads. They, you know, they, they, they got their tattoos in prison. They went to jail for killing black people. Or, uh, you know, allegedly killing them or something. Or, uh, you know, violating their rights, etc. In the most horrendous ways. And when they got released and took Islam, now he has an African-American wife. Eight kids. <laughs> right? SubhanAllah. Don't pass judgment. Don't pass judgment. Don't pass judgment. This is, this is the number one problem we're having. Undermine that discourse. Make that discussion about the ideological clash, make it irrelevant. There are bigger fish to fry. We got bigger problems. There's a serious reality outside we have to face in our family, among the youth of the Muslims, and then talk about the Muslims at large. May Allah Azza wa just give us a sense of perspective and concern for the rest of this ummah. May Allah Azza wa teach us how to use our knowledge wisely and to deliver the words of advice 
and of nasiha in the place that is appropriate. May Allah Azza wa Jal put barakah in our words because in the end our words don't change people, Allah changes people. So may Allah Azza wa Jal put barakah in our words and reward us for the efforts that we make to serve His deen. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Questions? Is this questions or something? Comments? Shoes throwing? You had mentioned that Jumar is an institution for how Jumar is how we can reach the the mess of you. Yes, everybody. But for our families, is there any institution that's in place that we can use to? Yeah, for our families, the institution now has become YouTube. You know, for, for the women in the house and stuff, they need to get hooked on some of this stuff that's available now. And um, some of it's really, really good. Some of it is really, really good. Uh, you have to start finding, you know, th there are some speakers that are academic, and there are other speakers that are just pure entertainment value. Right? And the student of knowledge says, I didn't learn anything from his speech. You didn't learn anything from his speech. But a lot of people started praying because they heard that speech. Right? So don't judge a, a, a speaker just based on how many hadith did he quote, how many ayat, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's also about how did they impact people psychologically, right? I can give you an example. I went to the uh, the uh, Ikna convention a couple of years ago, and I was listening to Imam Siraj. You know, he's like uh, a father figure to our community. May Allah preserve him and continue to give him shifa. You know, he's giving a speech, and his his speech sometimes goes everywhere, everywhere. From like once upon a time, I had a dog to like everywhere. And I was passing by a truck, all kinds of stories. And at the end of it, a serious student of knowledge will say, I don't know about that speech. But you know, the guy next to me was like, man, I got to start praying. He didn't say a word about prayer. <laughs> but it has that impact. It has that impact. So different people need different things. So since you know the, the, the temperament of your family members, you have to find the kinds of stuff that, they, that might appeal to them. And you have to be a little bit more creative in getting the message to them. The, your favorite speakers are not going to be their favorite speakers, for example. right? You have to use a little more uh, creative means. The other thing that some masajid have done very successfully is they've, they've made the masajid a place of halal social gathering. So, uh, and one of the things that attracted me to the community that I moved to is the families get together all the time. And that, so the masjid becomes the place to hang out and slowly religion comes into play because you're at the masjid anyway. So now just, you know, the women start networking with other women that are in touch with the deen, and it slowly starts, it starts reeling them in. It doesn't have, nothing happens overnight, though. Nothing happens overnight. Yeah. Uh, well, you mentioned something about, you know, youth that are you know, too zealous with their parents, and, you know, their parents are provoking them, and sometimes they snap. Yeah. And so after they snap, of course, the father-son relationship, mother-daughter relationship is somewhat ruined. No, it's not. Or yeah, after, there's after, that after, tension, then. Yeah, so you, think it, you think there is. When a, when a child snaps at their parents, you think there's tension, right? Okay, go get slapped. Go massage their feet. Don't move until they kick you off. Okay? Beg them to forgive you. Kill your ego when it comes to your parents. Kill your ego. Don't say there's tension. We don't talk anymore. He, he looks at me funny. Get your ego in the way. Get your ego out of the way. Be at their feet. They love you. They, your mother gave you birth. Your dad held you in his arms. There's love there. It's your, your abruptness that caused that friction, but it's you turning back into that two-year-old that will remove it immediately or over time. But you have to start, you have to tear away at it. You have to crush your ego. They don't. Don't expect it from them. Don't expect them to give you an inch. But you have to give miles and miles and miles. You understand? This is, it's a difficult journey. It requires things, but this is, this is a kind of jihad. This is a kind of jihad. In Surah Al-Ankabu, jihad with the parents. When jahadaka ala antu shrika bi ma laysa laka bihi ilm, fala tutihuma wa sahibhuma fi dunya ma'rufa. Don't obey them, but accompany them at the same time. SubhanAllah. Uh, then a sister, inshallah. Yeah. One issue that you mentioned is obviously um, being judgmental. And it's very, very common. It's a like, consistent fight within yourself to try not to be judgmental, not try to judge people. But it's, it's the same issue that you mentioned, like when we try to act, or when we actually want to act as ambassadors of Islam, we talk about Islam, we're just giving basic that way. Yeah. It's the whole idea of the other person's reaction that gives you that idea. I mean, if the person feels benefited and he comments or something like that, 
it gives you the first impression that you get it because I did something for him. So you do understand that being judgmental, even though without doubt is not is not excusable, is a byproduct of the fact that you have gained some knowledge, which is which is something that the person did not have, and you were able to. Yeah, when I say judgmental, I, I'm not saying you shouldn't be aware of who they are. No, no, no I understand. We do size them up, basically. We size people up. That's fine. But we don't judge what's in their heart. We don't judge their potential. It's OK to size somebody up and say, OK, this guy doesn't know much. I better talk to him this way, this way, this way. This person seems to have this kind of problem. You could, you could, you know, this is part of basira, and this is part of having insight, and this is kind of like you know, knowing your audience. So part of that is passing some sort of judgment. But I'm saying not passing judgment on their character, that this guy's fate is, fate is sealed. I mean, who, who, how is he ever going to change? How is he ever going to, come on, seriously, this guy? No, don't, don't pass that kind of judgment. But yeah, in, in Dawah, you do have to be cognizant of the age of the person you're talking to, the temperament, their mode of speech. You have to take all these things into consideration before you speak. And that's exactly what we're talking about in eloquence. You need to psychologically assess your audience before you speak to them. You need to kind of have an understanding of where they're coming from before you address them. Right? Sister side, any questions? It's all good? Yes, go ahead. Her and then you. Yes. Okay. So you're talking about the, the majority of these are not even like the left of you. Yeah. And um, we need to try to set up the gap with them. I know you mentioned that you don't have the solution to like have to reach out to them, but I think that's, I know in our community, that's always been a major concern because. Well, the there are some things you can start doing. How would you actually, like, where do you find them? I mean, is it going to be a special club or? First of all, you need to have amazing youth groups. Amazing youth groups. You need, I mean, I love YM. I really do. I, I love these guys. Um, I, I, I love any youth group. I don't mind MENA, MASS, youth, YM, MSA, whatever. It's, it's something. It's something, for God's sake. You can whine about it and say, this is their problem, this is their problem, this is their Man, it's something. We don't have an endless amount of resources. At least we got something, right? But the thing that I loved about YM in particular was they had guys that were in gangs coming to YM meetings and like, you know, playing ball or whatever. First of all, every masjid, the biggest investment to me for teenagers, ball court. Have a baller ball court. You better have it. You better have like, you know, ping pong tables for the uncles, really. And the fact that we're playing tells you we're getting uncled, okay? But you need a nice basketball court. You need a sister's lounge, a place where sisters can hang out. You know, some of the, the, the Muslims lose the, their way most in suburban towns. In big cities, Muslim population is big. A lot of Muslims in college, a lot of Muslims in high school. You kind of sort of, you know, even though you're messed up, it, there's still places, avenues you can find a social outlet. Like in Houston, there's a lot of Muslim youth hanging out, right? But in like Birmingham, Alabama, where are you going to go to hang out? Right? IHOP? Where are you going to go? Right? So what did they do? They did something really smart at the masjid there. They made a sister's lounge, a, a brother's lounge. And like, this is a place to chill. It's like they're a Starbucks inside the masjid or something. It's not a Starbucks. Don't pass fatwa, OK? They're just hanging out there. They're doing homework there. They're discussing there. They're, you know, they're, they're socializing at the masjid. The sisters among themselves, brothers among themselves. They found a, an, a, a, an acceptable outlet to get together. And when they're there, the adhan is called. They make salat too, right? But we need to create these alternatives. And if they're not there, we need to produce them. And if, you know, you don't have to solve the problems of hundreds of thousands of youth. You know, three or four kids that are messed up, you need to start hanging out with them a little bit. Maybe what, one of, part of your Islamic work is that you take them out to dinner every once a week. You don't discuss Islam with them for six months. It's okay. Build a bond with them first. Build a connection with them first. Then maybe bring up a hadith or two. Or maybe slip in a salah at the masjid. Right? It takes time. You're dealing with people. You don't, they're, not, you know, they're not robots. You don't say, uh, this is fun. OK, and they start praying. It doesn't work like that. You know, people say, take time in, in curbing their behavior, but you have to build a bond with them first. And that's, that requires a lot of patience. It requires a lot of patience. I mean, think about the work of the Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu think about the work of Nuh. Alayhi salam. It's not like he's talking to a different audience for 950 years. Who's he talking to? Same bunch. Same bunch. 
You, you try giving da'wah to somebody, they get annoyed with you in 45 minutes, they get annoyed with you, then you come back to the same guy and annoy him again, and then the same guy, and you do it for a week. Can you imagine trying to do that? What the attitude of that person would become towards you? Can you just imagine? The messengers, alayhim salam, go back to the same people over and over and over and over. And who do they go back to first? Who was the messenger commanded to warn first? And their ashiratak al right? Warn the closest of your family. That's who we are obliged to warn. Those are the people that, that, that we owe our da'wah to first. First. So, you know, develop that concern, inshallah ta'ala. There's a sister in the back and then I'll come to you. Yeah. Just to, just to reel them in, we sort of water it down for them? Yeah, that's a real problem. Yeah, we should, here's at least my personal philosophy on it, because I was in that position at one point too. The, the, question, yeah, the question is, you know, sometimes we try to bring the youth in and we try to connect with them and stuff, but then they'll ask a pointed question like, is hijab really fard? And you, you think in your head, well, if I tell this girl it's fard, then she might never come back. Right? Or this brother, if he says, Imam Salah has fought five times, right? then he might forget me and just go away. Right? And you, out of that fear, you don't share that with them. Well, we are asked, we speak the truth. We can't shy away from the truth. But the way you quote the truth is with taqwa. This is Allah's methodology in the Quran. Right? When he, he doesn't just tell you to obey him. What does he wrap the ayat of obedience with? Taqwa. Look at, look at Surah An-Nisa. Ayat of inheritance, where did they begin? Ya ayyuhan nas, Look at the ayat of divorce in Surah Al-Baqarah. Right? What, is, what keeps happening at the end of every ayah? Wattaqullah, wattaqullah, wa'alamu anna Allah ya'alamu ma fi anfusikum, fa'hdaruhu. Right? Be fearful, be, be in awe of Allah. So this, this idea of developing taqwa in people, why should you want to wear hijab anyway? You know? Just bring the, take it back to the root every time. Don't just answer with a yes or a no. Make it an opportunity for advice, right? That's what they really need. They need heartfelt, sincerely felt advice. You know, a lot of times people that are disconnected from the religion want to turn the religious discussion into what is halal and what is haram and that's it. Right? And they want to make that debate out of it. I don't think it's that bad. I don't think that, you know, and they bring it to you from an ethical point of view, other points of view. When you get questions like that, you need to redirect them in what direction? The fundamental cause so the, for the Muslim, you're not calling them to Iman because they have some of that already. You're calling them to Taqwa. Fear Allah. Be cautious of Allah. You find a way of instilling that fear and, and that awe of Allah. Shouldn't, you know, he's done so much for us. What should we do for him? What do you think? You know? So you, you put it in a psychological way. You don't necessarily try to intellectualize the issue. You try to put it in a, in a sort of a heartfelt kind of a way. It's very important. Just how you speak to people. Right? Because if you don't speak to them like that, it feels like you're trying to win an argument. And you'll never win that way. Even if you're right, you lose. Even if you win the argument, you lose. Because they become antagonistic towards you. You have a question, I think. Uh, yeah, okay. Yes. Um, I know you kind of answered this, but how do you deal with those uncles who are like, who are kind of folky? And the only thing that they're interested in talking about is like politics if they're not folky. Uh, okay, the, the uncles that are trying to poke you, you should be the best of friends to them. They, they, I, mean, I, I know uncles. I should have done a PhD in uncle psychology, okay? I know uncles. Uncles poke you because they get a kick out of irking you. You become their friend, they'll stop bothering you. You initiate the discussion. You don't walk away from them. Hey, hey, come here, Rita. Come here, I gotta ask you something. No, 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 you go to them. You ask them, you say, hey, want to go, go grab some chai after the salat? Chill out with the elders, and they'll, it'll break the ice. You, you have to initiate that. A lot of times, youth are allergic to the elders. That's a problem. It's weird, right? I mean, have a youth group, but that doesn't mean you alienate yourself with, from the elders, right? It's, it's a big problem in our community that the two are at odds sometimes. They shouldn't be. It should be one cohesive whole.
Uh, yes, I've been holding off on you. Yeah, I was just going to say, just like more clear, like this topic is way overdue. Uh, I really appreciate you addressing it to like keep them out here. Um, just a quick reminder myself is that the hadith where if you are used in Allah's guiding of someone, it's better than the world and everything in it. So whenever we get tired of you know doing da'wah on one person, we don't see like there are any progression going on. Just remember the hadith of if you if you are used to guide someone, it's literally better than everything. It may not be as fun as either heresiology or other subjects that someone from Harry Potter, but uh, <laughs> you know, I'm the uh, like you know just remember that hadith, you know. The motive. So if you could like elaborate on that, that'd be great. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think you did an excellent job doing so. I think I should hand you the mic to repeat that. Really? Yes, please. You have the mic. <clears throat> um, no, I was just saying there's a hadith uh, that my friends and I, when we, we were in this youth group, and we kind of talk about how we do da'wah to these kids, and we say that we each pick one kid or one or two kids, and we try to focus on them. We don't try to go for, like, the home run and get, like, 30 kids to come to Al Um And alhamdulillah, we've had a lot of success, and one of our mantras, one of our main mottos is the hadith where Rasulullah tells us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that if you are used by Allah to guide one person, it is literally better than everything in the world, like the entire world and everything in it. And so, you know, it, what I was saying was that it might be, you know, not as fun as coming to Ilm Summit, having two weeks of jam-packed knowledge with all the shiuch and everything, but remember the goal. Like, remember the end, is that you're getting everything, you're getting something that's better than the world and everything in it, inshallah. So, Jazakallah khair to Sheikh Naman, and sorry about that. Jazakallah khair, Ustaz Nu'man Ali. And one of the things that really um, gives me a lot of optimism for the future is the amount of cooperation that we see for the first time uh, between so many different du'at and so many different institutions. As you know, Nu'man Ali is not actually a part, per se, of Al-Maghrib. He started Al-Bayyina. And you all know dirty politics that happen every single masjid, every single community. One of the things that, alhamdulillah, and I'll tell you in all honesty, Al-Maghrib has stayed clear of is politics. And Anybody who is, inshallah, sincere for the da'wah, they find this from al-Maghrib and we find it in them. And Ustad Nu'man and our, ourselves, as you know, we formed a cooperation. We formed a very positive uh, force for the ummah. He teaches what we don't teach. We teach what he doesn't teach. Uh, what he doesn't teach. And it's something that, alhamdulillah, everybody benefits from. And this isn't just the first. Inshallah, there are other mergers as well. We're talking about other groups, other organizations. And I think that this is, it bodes well for the future. Alhamdulillah, it bodes well. That a bunch of dedicated, a group of dedicated du'at and scholars and activists and, you know, tajweed teachers and uh, teachers of, of Arabic nahu and balagha and specialists in fiqh and aqidah. I mean, alhamdulillah, do you guys not see the complementary nature of all of your instructors? I'm not a specialist in some fields, I'm a specialist in others. Uh, Yasser Bridge is specialist in others, Sheikh Walid is others, Ustad Ali in others, Wissam and others, Uthman and others. The fact that we all come together, wallahi, I wish I had this opportunity when I was 17, 18, 19. And then I had gone to Medina, my level would have been something else. When I went to Medina, and he's an Arabic teacher, so he can relate to this, I didn't even know a fa'il from a maf'ul. I didn't know mansub from marfu' from majzum. Okay? I'm a student at Medina, I didn't even know the difference between nahu and sarf. I had no clue what these sciences were. How I wish that I had this platform so that if when I had gone abroad, Allah knows where I would have been now. And the goal is you guys build on the shoulders of other people like I built upon uh, those who I studied with, right? That's the goal that we hope for every generation to come and to build upon what we have to offer. And it makes my heart melt to see all of these instructors and du'at and activists all come together. And we can be totally frank and say there are absolutely no politics that we have to hide. And I'll tell you, having worked with many organizations, there are lots of politics with many organizations. You all know this, with many messages, many groups. Alhamdulillah, Sheikh Walid, Sheikh Hasib Burgess, Ustad Wissam, Ustad Nu'man, Sheikh Uthman, we're actually genuinely friends. We actually call each other and we actually have a you know, good time when we get together. That's something very rare in an Islamic organization, much less two, three, four, multiple Islamic organizations coming together. And wallahi, this is a blessing from Allah, and I think that the future, inshallah ta'ala, is bright, uh, and, and I am very optimistic about the future.